Oh, uh, usually I start off with a bit of a spiel, but I've realized recently uh, that in the replay, uh, the recording doesn't actually start till about 20 or 30 seconds in. So every one of our archived uh, videos is me halfway through a sentence. So anyway, welcome to another Readsy Live, Readsy's ongoing series of webinars, where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing to teach you how to write, edit, market, and sell better books. Uh, this week, uh, we have another writing uh, episode. Uh, I'm very happy to bring back on a returning guest, Paro Bavishi. Uh, if you tuned in last year, uh, she and one of her colleagues did uh, a webinar for us on uh, YA, what sort of sells in the YA space, uh, young adult that is. Uh, and she's back today talking about anti-heroes. Uh, when I sent around an email to some of our users early in the year, uh, asking what you wanted to learn more about, uh, one of the big things was characters. Um, want to know how to write better characters, how to describe them, put them in plausible situations, make your readers fall in love with them, uh, and write endless books about them. But uh, tonight, uh, or today, depending on where you are, uh, we're going to uh, be talking specifically about anti-heroes, uh, which I'll let Parol and uh, our co-host Randall uh, explain for you. Uh, we'll bring them on in just a few minutes, but I can see uh, from the screen here, uh, a bunch of you are already online. Thank you so much, and thanks for letting us know where you're from. Uh, I see a good mix of people uh, from the States, uh, from the Midwest, we see people from Florida, California, and of course, always our Canadians. Uh, we always see a good Canadian contingent. Happy to see you guys. McCrew Dude from Southern Mass. Hello, BMMB from Montreal, uh, and Lindsay from Derbyshire here in the UK. Anyway, uh, I'm just going to wait another minute or so before I bring Parol and uh, Randall on. Uh, they're going to tell you a bit more about what they do. Uh, uh, at the end, they'll tell you a bit about the podcast they run together. Uh, and uh, they'll get into talking about anti-heroes, why we as readers love them, uh, and what you can uh, take from them and uh, apply to your own books and to your own stories and characters. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Philip. Oh, someone from Moldova. That's a new one for me, I think. Uh, Albania, Poland, Cheshire. Uh, fantastic. Becca Armando, uh, American living in the Netherlands. Uh, and Gihun Wang from an interdimensional mystery. Fantastic. Mysterious. Uh, Deb Moore from Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, and Diana from Canada, Edmonton. Okay, uh, well, it's two minutes past the hour. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure there'll be more people pouring in. Uh, but while, while we, uh, well, actually, no, give me one more second. I just want you to uh, do me a favor and hit the like button on this thing. It's a, it's a piece of uh, YouTubing business that I haven't got the hang of yet, but uh, if you uh, hit the like button for this, uh, and maybe even share. It really helps us get uh, more eyes on this and uh, uh, makes me look good in front of my bosses, which I always love. Um, okay, well, fantastic. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Parol and Randall, uh, who will be coming in just a couple of seconds. Hey, Parol. Hey. 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 Thank you, Martin. Hey, thank you for joining us. Uh, first of all, Parol, where are you today? I'm in London. I'm in South London. All right. We are separated by a river. We probably will meet in <laughs> Over. And Randall, I know uh, you're American, but where are you right now? I'm in Romania, so we're separated by a, a channel, I guess, at least. Yeah, and, and a couple of countries, I imagine. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Well, uh, we've got ooh, precisely 666 people tuned in right now. Ooh, I don't know what that ooh. means. There wasn't a better sign for us to get started. I'm going to knock off. Uh, I'll be waiting in the wings. If you need anything, just ask me. Uh, I've got your slide deck to pull up, so whenever you're ready for that, just let me know. Uh, otherwise, have fun, everyone, and I'll catch you at the end for the Q&A. Great. 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 And Martin, you can pull up the slide deck um, now. That's absolutely fine. So my name is Parle. Just two lines about me. I'm an editor. I have a particular fondness for thrillers and action, uh, and I've been an editor for 12 years. Uh, my Randall is a co-host on a podcast that I run. Randall, do you want to introduce yourself into two sentences? Yeah, so Randall, I'm an editor as well, and uh, also like thrillers, which is how we got uh, together. And I'm also, uh, I, I was in the military for a long time, so I specialize in military, mil uh, military thrillers. Yeah, you've done some pretty heavy stuff that we won't talk about today, but <laughs> you've done some pretty interesting things. And so um, this quote by Phoebe Waller-Bridge is where it all began, this sort of delve into the anti-hero. So Randall and I have both been following and analyzing Killing Eve, the series, amongst other series, uh, and the writer of that was Phoebe Waller-Bridge. And there's an interview where she talks about um, anti-heroes and heroines, and she says, 
I prefer not to know exactly how I feel about a character. And this really inspired me. I was thinking about like, yeah, like what is this allure? Why are, why are we seeing so many? Uh, we definitely have had in the past, but in today's world, in today's sort of TV series and films and books, we're seeing a lot of anti-heroes and heroines. What is it about them? And for a lot of the writers that I work with, you know, we all want to see characters that long, that last long after uh, the book is finished. So how are we going to do this? Well, obviously there's no magic answer because there never is. Uh, but I do think that there are some considerations that if you apply it to your work, um, it can help you to understand this topic a little bit deeper. And so going, going through some of the characters that um, you'll probably know, and you'll probably have tons more examples yourself, we've got, um, you know, Lestat from The Vampire Chronicles, we've got Eve Palastri from Killing Eve, uh, we've got Elizabeth Salander, Go with the Dragon Tattoo, what a great book. Uh, and we've got Taylor Durden from The Fight Club. So also, so that's what we're gonna answer today. The question is, you know, what do we, why do we like these unconventional heroes and heroines? And how can we create irresistible flawed characters of our own for our stories? So today, real quick, our agenda will be, what is uh, an anti-heroine or a hero? Uh, the three core questions you can use to help you round out your characters how to use your story showdown to bring out your character's true self. And then we're gonna analyze 10 anti-heroes and heroines to inspire your work. Great, so what is an anti-hero stroke heroine? And we'll use those words interchangeably. Um, so it generally seems to be accepted that it's a character who lacks uh, some of the conventional attributes of a traditional hero. So perhaps they're lacking in courage or morality. Is that precise enough though? No, I mean, so also, I think you can also say that it's a, it's a hero or, or the protagonist that does the right thing, but maybe not for the right reasons. For instance, you know, Superman's always like got the sake, the, the weight of the world's on his shoulders. He's always doing the right thing, but you got all these other heroes in movies, TV series, and, and books nowadays that they have their own selfish reasons for doing the things. And I think depending on the, the level of their, their own agendas, that they can be called anti-heroes. And uh, I think uh, if you guys are familiar with Christopher Vogler, he talks about uh, the anti-hero as a special kind of hero, one who may be an outlaw or villain from the point of view of society, but with whom the audience is basically in sympathy. And that's, and that's, that's what we're trying to do is create sympathetic characters, sympathetic protagonists for our readers. Yeah, exactly, and how do we know how do we know, how do we empathize with the character? Well, it really helps to understand what they stand for, even if it's an end, um, wh whatever their end is. And even if we don't agree with the means that they use to get there, because uh, you know, they, what they might want is quite noble, uh, but it's possible that their moral compass allows them to do things that our traditional heroes won't. So Jack Reach is a very good example. Um, he's quite happy to bust a few wrists and send some baddies to, to hospital kick them in the head, et cetera, as long as he protects the innocents. So I love this idea that the anti-hero simply stands for the end goal. That's a good way. And just a quick shout out that of course, you know, uh, the good old fashioned heroes are, are awesome too. Um, you know, the Wonder Woman's, the Captain America's, the, the classic detectives are awesome, but there is something so special um, about the anti-hero. And I thought, I actually went down a little bit of a rabbit hole and wanted to see, well, okay, how do you define a hero? If we're looking at anti-hero, then what, how would you classically define a hero? And so we have a person who is, you know, we, we all sort of know this, right? It's a person who we admire, uh, a person who's, um, who's done something very brave, uh, they've achieved something particularly great. Uh, I saw this definition, uh, a man of superhuman strength or physical courage, uh, Got, you've got words in, in French, my accent is terrible, hero uh, or heros from Latin. Um, but this idea of a defender, a protector, uh, really, really rings true. So today, obviously, we, we're referring to a hero and hero when it's not clearly not just for a male character. Um, and actually, the hero and heroine uh, aren't strictly linked to just action thriller and hero, um, often it's used interchangeably for the main protagonist of the story. And we'll, we'll touch upon that in a bit. So, okay, so what type of anti-heroes do we see? We, we looked at everything and tried to whittle it down to three. So, so the, the first one that we're gonna talk about is the imperfect or reluctant hero. And these are the heroes that 
they don't want to be heroes. They didn't start to be heroes. We got uh, Frodo and Bilbo Baggins from the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. They're hobbits. They don't do adventure. So they are kind of thrust into this into this hero uh, a job, and they resist it a lot. And then in the end, they they accomplish the mission. They 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 become the hero that they 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 were they they finish their character arc. They become the hero, and they're actually changed for the rest of their life. In the most part, they come back to their 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 shire, and they're not the same people. And and this this is also includes Jack Ryan, who's who's kind of a paper pusher, you know, intelligence analyst, and then he gets thrust into you know doing exciting things. We got Mitch McDear from the firm. You know, Tom Cruise played him pretty well. And we got also, if you want to go to Jurassic Park, we got the doctor paid by jo Jeff Goldblum. You know, he wasn't going to run around and fight dinosaurs. That wasn't what he went to school to do. Um, but he gets thrust into these to these positions where he's rescuing children and making really intelligent decisions based on his his knowledge from his studies. So he's using his gift. But that that's the the first the first one we're going to talk about is the imperfect or reluctant hero. Yeah. And next we have the morally gray hero. Uh, so here, Jack Sparrow is a really good example. Um, we've got Han Solo, uh, Tyrion Lannister, um, Hamlet, maybe? I'm not sure. I haven't fully decided on that one. Um, but these characters are undertaking a mission that ends in a just cause. So they've justified it by some means. Uh, but actually, they are motivated purely by their own, by, their, by themselves, by what they get out of it. Um, there are a lot of mercenary characters that fit into this, a lot of uh, Scandi detectives, these sort of imperfect, grumpy, uh, sometimes, you know, do the wrong thing. Uh, those sort of characters will also come into this bucket. And then the last one that we kind of broke down was the whatever the cost hero. And these are the, the anti-heroes that end up doing the right thing. Their object of desire are, are not necessarily on the, their end, their end state's going to be we accomplished the mission, we did the right thing, we saved the world or we saved the victim, but they do it at whatever cost. They, they, whoever gets in their way, whoever they have to kill, if they have to steal something to get to it. These are the, these are the whatever the cost heroes is what we classify them as. And some good examples are, you know, Batman, Jack Reacher, Elizabeth Salander, um, it, it, Eve Palastri, and as she evolves, Walter White, who's you know just trying to save his family, but he ends up being a, a, almost a villain, and in, in, you know in the end, Severus, uh, Severus Snape from Harry Potter, and the list goes on and on. There's some really good ones, and I don't know if there's any David Gamel fans out there from England, but he he did a master job making a lot of characters like that, Waylander, John Channel, people like that. We have a big U.S. Um, um, audience as well, so. Well, then they should read this because it's like the best <laughs> author ever. <laughs> Yeah, I know you're really passionate about it. Okay, and so next uh, we have some characters where, I don't know, are they a villain? Are they an anti-hero? Um, this guy, uh, I think it's Humbert Humbert from Lolita. Uh, could you could you think he's an anti-hero because he lacks the characteristics? Um, he's chasing a, an un underage girl. Uh, he thinks it's the love of his life um, and he justifies it to us in the way he writes. Uh, but you could easily, quite easily, uh, call him out for being a villain. We have other characters like that, like Tom Ripley. Um, and yeah, there, there are a whole bunch of characters that when we did an analysis, you're like, huh, what? It's, it's such a fine line sometimes between villain and anti-hero. Um, and to some degree, like we're classifying this just to try and just to try and get some sort of structure. In truth, um, the categorizations matter less than just understanding the different types, the, the variety of characters that we might find who enter this larger world of anti-hero. And then you have characters like Fleabag. Um, I don't know, is Fleabag watched um, that much in the US? I'm not sure. But Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who wrote Killing Eve, uh, that's actually her as the actor and, and the, the, the character. Is she an anti-heroine? Yes, to, in, the, in the sense that she's sort of outside the norm of a character who's, who's searching solace and solace for her grief and loss. She's not, this is an action or thriller. She's lost a best friend. She's trying to find love and trying to make sense of the world, but she does so in such a quirky, uh, wonderful way. Um, but maybe, maybe she could be classified as an anti-hero. And then you've also got people like Michael Scott in the office. So yeah, in the end, it, like I say, it doesn't really matter how we classify this. This is all about how do we create characters that we're drawn to. So we're gonna have a little, um, dig into that uh, and start with, sorry, sometimes I actually don't know what the next slide is. Uh, so 
why do we love antiheroes? And you'll you'll definitely have the answer to this already because you, that's why you're here. Um, but some of the thoughts that that I had were that actually they they evoke emotions in us uh, by the decisions they make. If you've watched Killing Eve in season one, she stabs Villanelle instead of arresting her or instead of kissing her, and that's quite an emotional. Uh, and strange decision to make, but that evokes a response in us. They take us outside their normal world, outside our normal world, uh, and they break boundaries that we don't. It's almost like we can live vicariously through them. Um, Robert McGee, who's an excellent um, teacher of screenwriting, um, he talks about how with your characters and anti-heroes and heroines, it's not about it's not about likability, it's about empathy. And he says, likability is no guarantee of audience involvement. Um, it's just an aspect of characterization. And he talks about how in order to get the audience involved, he talks about they need the glue of empathy. Uh, so if we empathize with the character and we know why they've made their decision, which is something we'll definitely touch upon soon, we might still connect them, even if they're going around stabbing, killing, shooting, stealing, lying, all these anti-hero traits. Right, um, Perul, that's, that's, those are all, I mean, those are great quotes, quote, great quotes and great points because, you know, how, how do you make your characters more empathetic? You have to make them real. You have to make them like the people that are reading and watching the shows and reading the books. And I, I, when I was doing research for this, I, I also stumbled upon a quote by uh, George R. R. Martin of, of uh, Game of Thrones fame. Uh, he was talking about his character, Tyrion Lan Lannister. And uh, he, 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 he described him as the deepest shade of gray. And then his quote is, I've always liked gray characters more than black or white characters. I look for ways to make my characters real and make them human. Characters who have good and bad, noble and selfish, well mixed in their natures, and 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 it seems like uh, the authentically flawed characters are becoming. Well, they're always been popular, but they're they're showing up in all kinds of strange places now, and and it's because people are kind of I I think tired of the black and white. They're, hey, you're either evil or you're good. They want to see uh, uh, something that they can be empathetic for in the villain and also in the in the hero because they want to make them realistic. And I think Killing Eve does it great for both the villain and the hero. It's really awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, I think the, making your characters empathetic is, is really a, a, a big step to making a great story. Yeah, and sometimes when you're like starting to create a character and you're thinking, okay, how can I make this character stand out? I've seen writers um, start to add layers to the character and say, well, okay, maybe they can have this one trait or two traits that makes them a slight, you know, turn, takes them into the shade of gray. But actually, uh, I think when you actually, as we will do, go and analyze the characters, sometimes it actually goes a lot deeper than that. And that's exactly what we're going to go into next, which is the characters that we think you can ask um, yourself to test and probe the characters that you've created to try and push them further, to try and round them out because it's possible that you actually have a lot of ideas in your head that you can see this character and all their motivations um, and that is something that your reader would also love to see. So the three questions, uh, what is the object of desire? So uh, Robert McGee describes the object of desire as the missing element. He talks about how a protagonist seeks to restore balance by this, this missing element uh, and it, simply put it's what they want. Um, so for Severus Snape, uh, what he wants, which we don't find out till the end of the series, but this is still fund fundamental to his character, uh, what he wants is to keep Harry Potter safe. Uh, why? Because he's sacrificing himself for the love of Lily Potter. Okay, so the next question uh, is how far will they go to get it? And here you've got Severus Snape risking everything he has. I mean, this is the darkest Lord of all time. Uh, he should not be named, and he's sitting at a table with him, pretending to be a Death Eater when actually he's double-crossing him. He knows that actually in any moment he might die. And the third question. So so this isn't so much a question as, as tracking your character arc and figuring out ahead of time if your character is going to change or not. Because there's a lot of characters, a lot of great characters that could be considered anti-heroes that... Am I, am I, shoot, yeah, I can still hear you. Oh, okay, I can't see. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of characters like James Bond and Jack Reacher that they just don't change. Uh, and and then there's other characters. We, we talked about the three different kinds of characters: the imperfect or reluctant hero. We got Jack Ryan, Bilbo Baggins, 
they actually change at the end. They have a different kind of worldview at the end. The world's bigger for them now. And then the 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 ones that do the right thing, whatever the cost, Batman, James Bond, uh, you know, Elizabeth Salander, they 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 have a goal, but at the end of the story, at the end of this chapter in their life, they're the same person. They still have the same code. And then they have these moral more the morally gray, unscrupulous heroes like uh, uh, Han Solo and Tyrion Lannister and, and the mercenaries. They, they kind of can go either way. But they may not change, they may change. In the case of John J Jack Sparrow, he doesn't change. He's still a pirate. He's still in it for himself, for his money, for his crew. Han Solo, on the other hand, starts out kind of a you know scrupulous, and then he ends up, you know, hey, I'm gonna be a part of this revolution. And so that that's something that you, when you're making these characters, you wanna think about. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So I guess it's with the characters you mentioned who don't change, it's their inner, their inner, view that either their worldview or their morality or status in a genre doesn't shift and it's not that one is better than the other um yeah i i have i can i can think of characters that i love who both have changed and haven't changed um internally across the the arc of the story yeah and if we're just going to follow the same uh trend what we're doing and talk about the uh, server snape you know he throughout the whole series he's like treating harry potter the same way and we don't know and it's very, it's very mysterious. We think he's a bad guy. He looks like a bad guy. He's wearing black. He treats Harry like that. He treats the hero badly, poorly. And as it evolves, we understand more and more why he treats Harry that way. But it is until, I mean, God, it's so masterfully done, right? At the end of the seventh book, the eighth movie, we find out why. We find out, you know, he, yeah. Lily Potter is, is his obsession. And because of what Voldemort did to her, he has this sole goal is to kind of get revenge for Lily. And and it, it's just so masterfully done. And it's, I don't know how many people can do eight books worth and keep that secret and, and still have great books along the way, but it's just great. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big fan as well. Awesome, thanks Randall. That's really, it's really interesting. Um, the next we have the showdown. The showdown is that big event, the thing that we know happens um, somewhere in the sort of last third probably of the book. And so for Harry Potter, uh, we have, this isn't the showdown actually. Uh, the showdown is when he, when Harry is with Voldemort, but for Severus Snape, this is his showdown. This is where we finally get to see who he is. This is where he reveals himself, um, his, his sort of inner world, which is that he's a changed man. And as a, as a, I say love interest, it's not like Lily was interested in him, but he proves his love for Lily, sacrifice of love, uh, which is what you might see in the love genre. Um, so my my point here uh, is that in the showdown for the character, the big event for the character, it's where you will see a, 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 a reveal. You'll see something really critical about who that character is and how they may have changed. So the, in this showdown, we're not we're we, sorry. We are very surprised in Bond when he has a showdown. We're like, yeah, of course. You know, you killed the bad guy, of course. Okay. So I come back for number twenty-seven. <laughs> okay, so now we get into the examples. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay, good. So we're going to look at uh, 10 anti-heroes and heroines, and we're going to look at those questions that we raised, those, uh, those questions. And actually, we're going to start with one extra question, which is, what is the defining element of this character? Because I always think that's really interesting. When you think, so for those of you who are, who are writing, if you think of some of the books that you love and the characters you love, uh, my question to you is what is the defining character, characteristic of them? But if you were to describe them to someone else, there's something that you can boil it down to. So Randall, you love Breaking Bad. Uh, you really love Walter White. Can you tell me a little bit about his defining element? So so Walter White is, an, is the anti-Superman, right? Superman is mild-mannered Clark Kent, right? Walter White is mild-mannered chemistry teacher. That's where he starts out. He's, he's not respected by the children. He's an underpaid teacher in an American high school. That's that. So I think that his, that this, this defining thing is he's a mild mannered chemistry teacher. And, and, and then he does these spectacular crazy things that are totally out of character for, for a chemistry teacher. Cause he's smart. I mean, to be a chemistry teacher, you gotta do some, you gotta, yeah. you gotta say some smart stuff. He's smarter than all the kids in the room, but they don't yeah. treat him like that. So I think that's his defining character. Just the fact that he's super smart and he's just a mild mannered chemistry teacher and he's going to do great, bad things, but great things nonetheless. 
Okay, and his object of desire, what does he really want? Uh, he really wants to protect, I mean, he starts out really wanting to protect his family because uh, he has cancer in the beginning. And uh, and he's like, I gotta I gotta support my family. I'm gonna die. How are they gonna live? I got kids, and and then his wife becomes pregnant. So that's even that escalates the progressive complication, and uh, so that's what he wants to do. He wants to save his family and make sure they're secure. And so how far will he go? He's willing to do a lot of nefarious stuff. He's willing to to meet with crazy bad people. He's willing to to deal drugs that are gonna kill more people. He's willing to kill. He's willing to cheat. He's willing to lie to his family. Uh, he's willing to do some bad things. And can you tell, tell, take us through a showdown? So uh, when he meets his big event, right. how does so he react? There's so many showdowns, but like I said, he, his defining thing is when you when you when you break this down, he's a chemistry teacher at a high school, so he's not really high on the totem pole. In the end of the first season, he's face to face with the biggest drug lord in town, and and he's like, hey, this is the way we're going to do business. And he's already thought this out. He's content. He's thought of contingencies. He set up a bomb, and he and the and the guy's like, "No, we're not going to do that." And he blows this guy's lair up. And then and the guy's like, "Oh wow, he meet this this guy's a real. He's the real deal." He convinces the drug lord that he's a drug lord, and <laughs> make, makes him do business with him. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> And because, his of his chem up. because of his chemistry, because he because makes the bomb with the That's chemistry. So it all comes together really nicely. And what about? It? Can you talk us through really quickly his character? Arc? Yeah, his character arc goes from, you know, chemistry teacher making a living with his loving his family to I don't have cancer anymore. I really don't have to do this anymore. But he's gets deep into it. He, you know, he turns, he's on the verge of turning super evil. I mean, he rescues some people at the end, but and poisons people. He's killing people right and left in the last in the last uh, season. So he's like this far away from being. The exact opposite of what he started as. Like I said, he's the anti-Superman. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I know, I've only watched. I've only watched a little bit of this. I haven't finished it. Oh, uh, it's really but, good. It's it's got such great such great characters. Okay, next. So you got you like Elizabeth Salander. So what's her defining characteristic? Uh, so Elizabeth Salander. The two things that I would say about her is that she's a hacker, incredibly smart, but she's also quite obsessed with being on her own. So she's a very intelligent woman who has some loner tendencies. And then, so what's her object of desire then? Um, so in the first book, which is the one I have on my desk, um, in the first book, she just wants to solve a case that seems like a dead end to start with, but actually ends up being chasing a, a serial killer. Um, but it's very personal to her because, and we don't really find out until later on, it's, it's about violence towards women. So women have been murdered horrifically, and her object of desire is to absolutely nail the, the person who did that. And how far is she going to go for that objective? <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Right? So this is it. Yeah, she's. I mean, it's really interesting comparing her and comparing someone like Eve Pilastri. They're not the same person, but it's interesting that how far they'll go. So you're looking at her. You might, you know, she's sort of goth to the nth degree. Um, she does look a bit sort of dangerous, so to speak, but she's, remember, she's very tiny. She's a waif. Um, she's angry a lot, but she's not necessarily physically imposing. And yet she will take down a grown man. And she does take down a grown, a grown man, as we'll find out in the showdown. But she's willing to rape because she rapes the guy who raped her brutally. And she's willing to kill if she needs to. Um, I don't think she's ever been successful in killing anyone, though. No, but she's definitely attempted to kill because justice is what she's after and i think she's a very good example of, of of making the choice about your character arc when you when you write your story what's her character arc like yeah so she's she's interesting because she changes so subtly um which means to say she doesn't really change that much at all um she's still very much a loner by the end uh, she's still um, just as brilliant as she always was. There is a softening to her, but it's very slight. And as, as the books go on, we realize why that is. And that's because she's endured such terrible, terrible um, treatment since she was a child. It's not like it wouldn't be realistic for her to shake that off. So in terms of her like inner worldview, that shift, it stays at um, disillusionment almost throughout. And she just always looks to confirm that. So even like when Blunkfist, her sidekick, um, sleeps with someone else because yeah, she sleeps with him she immediately just takes that so personally and they weren't exclusive 
Um, for those of you who read it, you'll know what I mean. So yeah, it's interesting. Uh, she doesn't change. Right, she's kind of like a female uh, Jack Reacher or James Bond even. Um, what about what about the showdown? Yeah. How does this all manifest in the showdown? So the big showdown in the first book is where the investigator she's working with, or the journalist, Michael Blunkfist, um, is being strung up to uh, for a potential rape and murder. Uh, and in comes this, uh, this creature, <laughs> small and fierce, and she takes down this serial killer um, with such anger and such fury. And it really ties in all the things that we're just saying. Her object of desire is justice. She's determined to get it. She doesn't matter. She doesn't care how she gets it done. And we see that in, in this showdown. Yeah, it's a good, it's a really good series too. I just love that series so much. I, st I mean, so it's so many years now, but I still adore it. Hey, it's Martin here. I just okay, to next. Because uh, the original Swedish title for it is Men Who Hate Women, which I think sort of pretty much puts like a, a real- <laughs> Yeah. I know, right? Points on it. So yeah, so I and I, I not, yeah, no, absolutely. I I um so I worked at that publisher at the time when it was coming out. I wasn't involved with that. I wasn't that lucky. Um, but I did. I remember the I remember the conversations going on about the titles, uh, vaguely. So it wasn't it wasn't taken. I don't think it was taken lightly. Um, but you're right. Yeah, men who hate women. That was. I think that was the. Third one or the second one? The first one was definitely the girl with the dragon tattoo. I think. Yeah, I think it, maybe it's the second first. one or the third one. The four men. Okay. Cool. Okay. So next we have Eve Palastri. Killing Eve. We both love this one. Yeah, we do. Um, so, so basically, her defining feature is, I mean, really, she's just super intelligent and kind of uh, her gift is figuring stuff out that other people can't figure out. And in this case, she's also obsessed with female serial killers, not just serial killers. So yes. that's kind of a really kind of a, a unique thing about her that people will always remember, I think, when, when they talk about this series. Yeah, and what about her objective design? Well, she wants more excitement in her life. She's kind of, She doesn't like her. She's got a security job with MI5, which you'd think that'd have enough excitement, but she wants to be in charge of, you know, she, she thinks she can, she, she's done all this research on female assassins and she really wants to, that's what she wants to do. And she gets kind of the opportunity and she speaks out loud and, and people kind of belittle her and tell her she doesn't know what she's talking about, but she ends up being right on point. So that's yeah. what she wants to do. She wants to be more involved and she wants to track down serial killers and save the world, be yeah. a hero. Yes, she's absolutely single-minded. And how far will she go? Well, in the beginning, she's a very uh, by the book. You know, she, she wants to be by the book. She's kind of offended when other people aren't by the book even. And so her boss kind of, Goes off, goes off on some tangents, and she's like disappointed in her and stuff. But as the series progresses, she definitely uh, throws the book away. And as you mentioned, she, you know, where I remember when we when we did this on our on our podcast, you were saying, "What, what other series book would yeah. you have someone? <laughs> do I stab her or do I kiss her?" But it was right after Game of Thrones ended, and you yeah, didn't see it. And I was funny. like, "Well, Game of Thrones kind of did that already." But yeah. uh, but uh, basically, yeah, you know, you got to that. They sitting down in the bed. They kind of talk. She was fired, and they're they're laying next to each other. And you, it's a really romantic moment. And you think they might kiss, and she reaches over and stabs Villanelle, and it's super surprising. There's a really good ending to the season. So she's willing to lie, cheat, stab, think about kissing the villain even. So she's kind of betraying what she's what you want her object object of desire almost. Yeah, and because for those of you who might have seen all seasons, or those of you who haven't, um, if anyone ever wanted to compare, like look at an Eve Palastri character, I would definitely recommend season one over season two and three for her character arc. Season two and three, I don't think are great examples of, necessarily great examples of character arcs. Season one is just unbelievably good. Okay, so next. We have Mr. Reacher, Jack Mr. Reacher. Mr. Reacher, what's, what, what's, what's special about him? So much special about him. Um, I like to think that he has the unyielding philosophy of a Western character. You don't find people, men, uh, characters like this who don't have a place of a play at home. They wander around with just the clothes on their back and they don't wish to be held down by society in any way. And yet they believe in freedom. But the Western character is the thing that I think about the most when I think about him. Yeah, and, what, and just in, in, incidentally, I've I've had conversations with people on trains because they've been reading Jack Reacher, and uh, we've just I end up always talking to anyone who holds that book, 
And inevitably, they always say to me, God, don't you love that he just has no possessions? They always say the same things. I have no possessions. My Jack Reacher. <laughs> my parents love those books too. Um, okay, so then, um, what's his object of desire? Um, so for him, um, in every single book, but say, I mean, one shot is, is one book, uh, but in every single book, it's normally to solve, get whatever crime that somehow landed on his lap out the way, because he just wants to, he just wants to explore America. That's his whole point. Is he's been in the military for so long, but lived across so many different countries. But the crimes are almost like, oh, oh God, I have to solve this. Fine, I will, because you know my mom always taught me that I should protect those that are smaller than me. <laughs> Uh, and so in one shot, it's a puzzling crime of a shooting attack and there's, the man asks for him specifically. So he has to solve it before he can continue on his, uh, you know, hitchhiking ways. And how far is he going to go to reach that objective? Interestingly, so it's whatever it, it's whatever it takes as long as innocence are protected. And I think it's interesting to compare him to Elizabeth Salander. So she's, she's smaller than him. She, she definitely doesn't have that. She's happy with possession. Um, and she, she has more emotion in, in when she, she enacts justice. With him, it's a very cold calculating, oh, you're in my way, okay, I'm gonna have to break your wrist. I won't actually kill you, but I'll make sure that you'll have to, you know, you won't be eating uh, for two months. So it's an interesting calculated attack on anyone who comes in his way. It's interesting that you say she's smaller than him, and then they Tom Cruise played him in the movie. Oh, don't even get me started. Because <laughs> he's like six foot six, two fifty. So upset about that. Like that. Yeah, <laughs> not happy about that one. And and what about his character arc? Oh, his character arc—he doesn't change. Right. Uh, only in some of the later later ones, he changed. He softens a little bit. Which, yeah, I've I've seen two books where I've seen very small character traits that have shifted. Uh, like he feels a bit bad about not having money when he meets up with all his old, all, all his old military uh, friends, uh, and he tries to settle down with with one, with maybe two women that I've seen him try to settle down with. Yeah. Okay. Next. All right. Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock uh, Holmes. I'm taking your British, uh, your British heroes away from you. <laughs> yeah. So it's this. This may be surprising to someone, but really, if you look at him, especially the way he's portrayed um, by um, Cumberbatch, it's he is bored. He doesn't care about the people he's solving the the mysteries for. He doesn't. He he treats them like he treats them like they're in his way, especially if they're not giving him the right information, especially when they're lying to him. He just calls them out on it. He's bored. He wants to accomplish the mission. So he's super, you know, obviously his trait is he's vastly more intelligent to everyone. All right. His object of desire is he's bored and he wants to solve that however he can. In fact, there I think the last movie he was for the first 10 minutes, he's like, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. He said like 15 times. How far is he willing to go? He's willing to endanger himself. He's willing to endanger his friends. He his he's got to solve the mystery. That's the only thing that's important to him. And mm -hmm. how's and uh and really at the end, uh, you know, he's not worried about, you know. He, he's just worried about solving the mystery. You know, he doesn't even care if the criminal goes to jail half the time. I don't really this think. This is a bit like Eve Palastri. She does. Yeah. She's she's got that. Apart from she's not quite so smart. Uh, she's not. She's not as smart. No. She, she part of her characteristic is being bumbling, but she doesn't care whether the villain goes to jail or not necessarily. She just, she wants, just to wants to solve it. Solve it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So exactly. that's that's Sherlock Holmes. I think it. I think it's a really interesting when I when you look at it. It it kind of meets all the anti-hero uh, check, checks. Yeah, which which I guess what we're saying is it gives him a depth of character. These sort of we know, you know, you'll know this as well, right? If you really get into a series or a book, you feel like you know them, like you know what they eat, you know what they like and what they don't like. You really know it, and it isn't it isn't banal. Um, it's not as simple as just drinks a lot of coffee. It's it's a lot more complex than that. You sort of understand how they might react in any given situation, and because of the way the writer has created showdowns in the most stressful situations you know how they're going to react as in or you, once you've read it you 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 understand the depth of who they really are and you anticipate it and that's why that's yeah. why these yeah these when you serial would see, characters yeah. are so great because you know you're anticipating yeah. it and even the little things you anticipate like you always anticipate james yeah. bond going hey shaken not stirred and everyone's like ah that's him yeah or even like um yeah even like Eve Palastri to some degree, Villanelle isn't quite an anti-hero, but you certainly anticipate her sense of humor coming into every kill. Yeah. Okay, Here's next. Jack Sparrow. Ooh, Tom. Time for just about one more, just to get some time in for the Q&A. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Sorry, okay. Maybe, hold on, should we, should we skip to 
Tyrion. Tyrion. All right, Tyrion. So Tyrion Lannister, we kind of I kind of mentioned him before, uh, and really, uh, so we're talking about Game of Thrones. In case no one's seen it here, that's listening. But basically, his his one characteristic is he's non-threatening. He wants to be non-threatening because he's in a position. Uh, you know, I don't know what number he is to the throne, but people can see that as a threat, and they can take him out. And he is defenseless. He's a dwarf. He doesn't know how to fight. We see that numerous times through the first couple series, the first couple seasons. And so his main thing is he's non-threatening, and his ob objective desire is to survive, especially in the beginning. You know, he 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 has a character arc. So his his desire is to survive. And in the beginning, how far will he go? Well, he'll do some unscrupulous things to survive. He, he did it. He did a. He he's betrayed people. He's uh, yeah. he killed his father. Um, yeah. and, and so he'll do some, he'll, he'll do what he has to, to survive. And, and he, like I said, he has a character arc, you know, he's really smart. He's kind of feels like he's underappreciated and then, you know, kills his father. He becomes the mentor to the dragon queen. I mean, he's, he does have a character arc and he, and he, and he believes in, in good in the end. So here's and a then, challenge for you. Um, because we've, we've got three more sides. I know we have to go to Q and A. Should we just do one or two words for each of the next characters? Sure. Just super quick. So Han Solo. Han Solo, perfect. Super quick. Charm, devil. Charm, charm devil may care attitude. Uh, Wants you know. to survive, doesn't care about anyone else really. That's right, and then he has a character arc. He changes, he changes from being only into about himself to being about his friends. Exactly, great, okay, Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow, so does, no character arc. He's the same guy in the beginning, same as the end. He's all about himself for the most part, and yeah. he, he, he ends up doing good by accident because it kind of gets him where he wants to go. Yeah, and we've uh, already touched upon Severus Snape. Yep. Good. Uh, Those will be on the show notes, right? Yes, we'll also have show notes, uh, we're, we're, and we'll we'll discuss some of the other characters in a bit more depth. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, well, everyone, I will stick around for a bit of a Q and A. So uh, please post them in there. I'll try to bring them up as they come along. Uh, but while we wait for that, I have a couple of questions, I guess myself. Um, yeah. So I guess uh, the key to, as you say, making uh, a protagonist an anti-hero, well, I guess, is the need to make them empathetic in some way, I guess. Uh, would you say that this is the sort of key between like the villain and the, and the anti-hero? The difference, you mean? Yeah, is, is empathy. What's the, what's, the, what's the fine line between the villain and the anti-hero? Uh, I, think, I think it comes down to the end. So the villain fundamentally wants an end that we can't, they may try and convince us otherwise, like uh, Humbert, Humbert and Lolita, um, or in Crime and Punishment, they're trying to convince us of why they did what they did, but we fundamentally don't think it's a justifiable cause. We can't get on board with their end. To me, that's why Villanelle could never be an anti-hero, but Eve can, sort of. All right, uh, and uh, Randall, would you say that uh, the idea of like a, a virtuous, like a purely virtuous character sort of an Atticus Finch type is sort of out of fashion these days. And you find that a lot more people are expecting these characters with a gray area. So I think there's a, I think there's room for it, and this is why. Because and I, and I'm I, I'm a sucker for Captain America. I love Scott, Captain America, and he's pretty much as clean and white as you can be, right? But what you do is you can build him up to be that way in the beginning or in the first part of your series or something like that. But then he comes up with some hard decisions because the world isn't black and white and you can only be white for so long because something's going to step in your way like the coronavirus or something else and you have to make decisions so i think there's opportunity there to to start that way but i don't think making a white making a, a, a just a pure white hero for for multiple series books or tv shows is going to work anymore now okay Paul, i've got the first question here for you uh, Maya asks, are there anti-hero uh, anti tropes, tropes that get repetitive that we should be mindful of? It's interesting, isn't it? It's like, can you ever come up with innovative characters, totally innovative characters? Um, I think that we can innovate on what's been done. So sometimes when you look at someone like, if you look at the dynamic between Eve Palastri and Villanelle, what you find is innovation. You've seen characters a bit like that before. You've seen uh, detectives or MI6 or sort of investigators who are a bit, off the rails, but I don't know that I've recently seen anything that combines the love genre in that way. So in terms of tropes, I, I, I sort of throw that a little bit back to you, which is to say, if you think of some of the, if you think of three um, anti-heroes that you really, really like, um, is there anything that stands out to you as being different about them? 
So the answer is a bit longer, which is that the deeper you go into their character, the chances are that you'll be, there'll be something innovative about them, which is why we ask those questions so that you can actually explore that yourself. Cool. Yeah, I guess like as long as they are fully realized characters, then uh, yeah. it doesn't become a cliche. It just becomes who they are. Uh, Randall's got one here for you. Can there be more than one anti-hero in a story? Maybe a ragtag group of, group of anti-heroes? So I think, uh, I mean, I, obviously, I mean, the X Men. There's a, there's a bunch of anti heroes in there that that do that do. They're all they probably they probably approach all three different uh, levels of what, what we're talking about. And then the Umbrella Academy also kind of a weird mix of people. So yeah, I think you can have a group a ragtag group of anti heroes. Absolutely. I've just seen two. I've just seen two comments that I want to address. One is, um, and this Randall, you, you can step in as well. One is, is the Joker. Um, an anti-hero and then also uh, Dumbledore. So the villain, uh, sorry, the Joker for me is a, you can see how you might be sympathetic to what, to where he's come from. But to me, his end goal, the end is not something that I can, that I, I feel a, 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 an anti-hero would, I don't think you'd go quite that dark. It is a subjective opinion. Someone also made a comment that these things are subjective. Absolutely, they are. And that's why some books and some things you read at the time might seem like you can get on board with what that character's trying to do, but maybe in 10 years time, that's no longer acceptable. We do, like Lolita is an interesting example. Um, I've, I was reading a whole bunch of stuff online about how it's increasingly become more and more difficult to accept this character going after a 12, a 12 or 13 year old girl. Um, do you have any thoughts on Dumbledore? As an anti-hero? I don't know, I think he's just a hero. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't have anything bad to say about a Dumbledore. I agree. Would you say that in order to sort of count as an anti-hero, they would have to be in some way a protagonist, like a secondary or tertiary character? Would you say that they're sort of bucking any sort of expectations that the readers have of them? Like I, I always imagine that it almost kind of had to be either a character, main character, or very close to being one. I, I would agree with that, Martin. And 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 I would I would say like uh, for instance uh, Johnny Depp's character in Pirate of the Caribbean it wasn't supposed it was supposed to be a, a minor character, and then he stepped into the role and it became equal to the other two protagonists. And that's the only reason he is the antihero. If he was just a a, a kind of a a, a prop, it he wouldn't be an antihero, I believe, because we wouldn't get to know him well enough. Uh, um, Carol, I'll ask this one for you. Uh, Paul asks, is it okay if the story has no antagonist, so long as there is an anti-hero? Paula, yeah, really interesting question. Um, I haven't yet seen an example that works for me. Uh, we're currently analyzing season three of Killing Eve, and we struggle with the fact that the antagonist is not clearly defined, and we do have anti-heroes. Because remember that the anti-hero, even if they are sort of off the rails, so to speak, they still need an antagonist to push against. So whatever it is they want, they need something to, to counter them. So you're, I'd say your hero is only good as as your as your villain. And if you if you don't have a villain, then your hero has nothing to. You, the choices that the hero makes don't don't really don't really mean anything to the viewer or or, or the reader. Um, so so what you're saying so what you're saying, Randall, is that the anti-hero and hero are still on the same side of the fence, fundamentally, because that's right. what her, Paula's question was like. Does the anti-hero mean that you don't no longer need a villain? It's actually not that. It's not, no, that's no. not what we're saying. Uh, but but also you don't have to have a person as a villain. You can have environment, for instance, or something like that. So just just think about that. Yes, yeah, right. it can be institutions. It could be like face right, the, right. Like you know the the government or like uh, the laws or nature itself. Environment, right. jaws, yeah, the you know a tsunami. Uh, Elisa asks uh, asks this one to you, Randall. Should, uh, it's more from a practical perspective. Uh, both of you may have uh, thoughts on this. Uh, should you write your entire first draft and then layer in characters' depths, or should you really know your characters in and out before before you start? Yeah, it, it, that's per, that's that's by each author needs to make that decision if they're a pantser or a planner, right? Um, I think the more that you have in the back of your head what kind of character your hero is going to be and what the character arc is going to be, you may look forward to less rewrites. Um, because you'll have to go back and kind of put it all back together. But go ahead, Pearl. I was just going to say, I've seen writers do this. Um, I've seen writers who are, who like have had multi, you know, multiple books under their belt. Um, so they've, you know, they're published, they're published their, you know, you know they, they can write, but I still see them take out that scalpel and sort of carve away and add in those layers. 
So I, I don't know if I've ever not seen that to some degree. So I feel like the degree to which you do that depends on how much you've thought of it beforehand, but you probably will always be doing a little bit extra layering as you go along. Uh, Parallel, as I've been hearing this one quite a lot, it's quite interesting. Uh, how do you write a character who is sympathetic, but you don't really agree with the choices they make for themselves over and over? I guess the idea of do you have to be, you know, on the level with your character in order to to like them and to uh, or write them for them or read and enjoy what they do? That's an excellent question, Amy, um, and it's a question I keep asking myself when I think as characters like Elizabeth Salander. She's not very likable in many, many ways, but I think she's brilliant. And I, I understand the end she's going for. I may not always agree with it, but I understand the end. Same with um, Eve Palastri. I <coughs> definitely don't always agree with how she behaves in season two and three, and even season one. She lets the, the villain get away, but I understand her end goal. I empathize with the fact that she's starting to fall for uh, Villanelle the villain. And even though I don't agree that she should, I, I see it, I get it. So I think that's I think it's like when you can you can understand what their end is. Cool. Uh, sorry, I'm going to bring this one up. Thomas Becker asks, uh, "This one's for you, Randall. Is it possible to define the hero via other characters' reactions and responses?" So I guess this is more of a nitty gritty craft question. Yeah, I think, uh, that's a good question, Thomas. So yeah, of course, of course, you 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 define your character through through a couple of different ways. One is by the choices the character actually makes, but also by the way the characters around him react. You know, if he's Captain America, you can see in the Avengers it's done so well, Captain America, everyone reacts to him because he is the white guy, the, the white knight in, in shiny armor. And, and and you can see that clearly in the Avengers. So I, I, it's, it's obviously the characters around him that you develop, their reactions to your characters are gonna be just as important as the characters' choices themselves. Cool. Uh, we'll look for just a couple more questions. Uh, da -da -da -da. Let's see. Oh, sorry. This is. Um, oh, this is an, an interesting one. Uh, was it? Someone brought up the idea of Bursi Worcester from uh, the Jeeves and Worcester novels as a potential anti hero in the sense that where well, he is someone who completely bumbles all the time, is a bit ineffectual and uh, lacking self-awareness is that would that sort of classify him as a bit of an anti-hero so i think that we talked about the spectrum and we talked about so there's two things we talked about the broader definition that we think we found that people seem to like which is that they just don't la they just don't have the classic characteristics of a hero, which is that they're sort of courageous and, and brave and um, accomplished. Maybe I don't know. That's not always a, a heroic quality. Um, yes, you can have an anti-hero who makes many mistakes, but if they fundamentally don't have an end that they're heading for, a goal that they're heading for, then I'm not sure if they're an anti-hero or whether they are just a character. Cool. Uh, just. There's uh, someone on the message board, Gihan Wang, that has been posting something 50 times. I doubt we know it, but <laughs> are you aware of Light Yagami from Death Note? I think it uh, could be an obscure character, perhaps from an anime. It's an anime or something. I'm a I'm, I'm, I am sorry, we, we don't, sorry. we haven't, I'm not, anime is not my forte at all. My um, son would probably know that. Yeah, I mean, and also listen, this is, and this is, I suppose, you know, when it comes to trying to figure out a character, figure out how to write your character, I always think of uh, masterworks, and that's what Randall and I have done. We've pulled out works that we think that have appealed to us, and we've looked at the characters and how, you know, we've asked those questions, you know, like um, what, were the, what was their object of desire? How does their character arc move? Um, uh, and, you know, what was that showdown? How is it for, you know, how does that play out in real life? And you can do the same because obviously we have, we might not have mentioned books or works that are important to you, but you can apply those same questions to that work. Uh, and I'd be really interested to hear what, what comes out of it. I imagine there's there's a similarity of the types of characters you find, because obviously the mediums flow into each other, anime, film, books, you know, popular ones spread across. Cool, awesome. Uh, all right, guys, uh, before we head off, uh, I know you both uh, have a podcast. Uh, would you care to tell the folks a little bit more about it? Yeah, Randall, go ahead. Does the story work? Uh, it's called the uh, S uh, Story Grid Showrunners. 
Uh, you can get it on any of the platforms that you uh, that you listen to. Um, and basically, we analyze television series. We started out with Killing the Eve season one. We moved into season two, and we do the uh, we, 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 since we're Story Grid editors, we do what's called a six core question analysis and a full scap, which is a one page analysis of the whole uh, plot of the of the the uh, TV series. Yeah. And, and the reason, done, go ahead. oh, sorry, uh, I was just going to say the reason we do this is because for this very reason I just talked about before, uh, that I, I feel like in, in order to be a good editor uh, and a writer, I just want to keep looking and analyzing what other characters are doing. And obviously I love storytelling. So we've also looked at The Witcher, we've looked at you, I looked at the Umbrella Academy, uh, and actually we're looking for suggestions for the next show. Uh, so if you know of any good, amazing shows uh, that we should analyze, we'd love to hear from you. So you can go to show uh, SG Showrunners. Dot com is that right, Randall? SGShowrunners.com, correct. Yeah. Cool, amazing. Thank you so much, guys. As we said, uh, we're going to do a transcript of this talk that will be up on our blog later in the week. If you registered on Eventbrite, uh, you get an email probably Friday morning with this. Otherwise, uh, I'd encourage you to go to our page on Eventbrite. So search for Readsy on Eventbrite, and you'll see uh, we've got a lot of great live events coming up soon. Uh, if you're struggling to write uh, during this current uh, situation, whether we're talking about political situation or the COVID thing, we're running a live write-in this Friday. It's the sixth one we've done, I think. Uh, all you have to do is log in, and uh, a bunch of us will be on there and just writing pretty much in silence, but we'll be setting 20-minute sprints, uh, and it's a great uh, communal environment in which to write. And then we have a few more webinars coming up. Uh, the return of First Line Frenzy, uh, where you send in the first line of your book or your story, and uh, Rebecca Heyman, one of our editors, will critique it for you. And then later on uh, next month, we have Jeff Lyons, uh, who is a story developer, a story structure expert, who will be uh, working with a few of you to develop a log line for your story. So for that one, you can submit uh, your pitch, and then uh, we'll actually bring you live onto this presentation, you can join us here, and uh, Jeff will be uh, working through uh, your log line, and uh, be a good way to, to learn how to build all that together. Okay, well, thank you, both of you. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Uh, You're very welcome. You both well. I uh, hope to see you again at some point soon. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, you two stick on here. I'll have a chat afterwards. Everyone at home, have a great day. Bye.